they just returned from. Amen. Amen. 1,500 people down at uh, Panama City Beach, Florida, uh, worshiping and praising God. Well, welcome to LifeGate. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. We, uh, we love you. Lord, I pray today that as we share about your wonderful cross and the things that it means to our lives, that um, lives will be touched and, Lord, that we'll truly become the lights that you've told us to be. I ask you to help us. Uh, Father, I pray for myself that I'll not talk too fast, but do it efficiently. The things we'll say will be interesting and that will be uh, heartwarming and life-changing. So I ask you to bless us. Anoint our ears that we can hear and anoint me that I can talk well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, we're in a series and our series is, is called Simply Irresistible. That's our, that's our title of our, of our series that we're in. I believe that the kingdom of God and the church is and should be simply irresistible. I believe that, that when people see the church and, and, and think about church, it should be a positive thought, a, a thought that draws them in. I, I, I believe that church should be have an irresistible um, parking lot, a, a, an irresistible facility. I think it should have an irresistible nursery, an irresistible... Uh, I think it should have an irresistible children's ministry. I think it should have an irresistible uh, adult ministry. I think it should have irresistible praise and worship and irresistible preaching and teaching. I think that everything about it should be irresistible. Uh, Jesus was irresistible, was he not? When, when, when Jesus was, was working and ministering on this earth, what he would do is he would create irresistible environments, and he strategically did this. He strategically thought through and planned an irresistible environment so that when people came into that environment, they were in an environment that allowed the Holy Spirit of God to minister to them. And I think that's what we should do. Jesus needs us to be irresistible. He wants us to be irresistible, and He wants the church to be irresistible. Uh, Jesus says this in John chapter 12 and verse 32. He says, And I, if I be lifted up, speaking of the death He would die, I will do what? I will draw all men unto me, all men, all humanity, all kinds of people, all colors of people, all nationalities of people, all, all uh, ages of people, all ethnic groups, uh, all age groups, everybody. He says, nobody is immune to my drawing. And, and so Jesus says, I'm going to draw them to me. This is his plan. He has an irresistible uh, environment that he wants us to have. And I showed you last week that more people are Christians now, today, than ever in history. That Christianity is the majority of people in this earth. I showed you the phenomenal things that's happening in Africa, in China, in the United States, all over the world. People are coming into the kingdom of God in unprecedented ways. It's amazing what God is doing in the earth today. This is God's plan. We talked about in Daniel how Daniel said that, that the stone would be cut out of a mountain and it would grow into a great mountain that would fill the whole earth. That's what's happening in our lifetimes. It is irresistible. All over the earth, the kingdom of God is growing and spreading. And Jesus says, nobody is, is, is immune to my drawing power. I want, I want you to hear something. I don't care what you go home today and turn the television on and hear the doom and gloomers talking about a great tribulation and all that stuff. I want you to hear me say, we are winning. <laughs> Light is filling this earth. We're winning. <laughs> What we do strategically, what you and I get to do strategically to set up strategic, irresistible environments is the greatest thing that any of us can do. Uh, we are all products of our environment, are we not? We talk the way our environment talks. I talk American English. Why? That's the environment that I'm in. <laughs> I talk North Georgia American English. <laughs> there you go, huh? Uh, actually, I talk Floridian, but, but anyway, the, the, my point is, is that we are all products of our environment. We dress the way our environment ta dresses, we talk, we live, uh, uh, we get around educated people, we want education, and, and, envi and our environments so impress us. Uh, let me sh tell you what I'm talking about. We showed you clips here about the youth camp. See, that was a strategic environment that was set up for those young people. 
They went down there. It was thought through. The speakers were thought through. The environment was thought through. The music was thought through. Uh, the whole arrangements of things was thought through. And you saw those children jumping and praising God, their hands lifted up. They went out on the beach. They would cry and pray and minister to one another. I mean, it was, it was a fantastic thing that they went through because of an environment that was strategically set up for them. Now, you take that same group to that same city and you put them in a rock concert. And you'll find that that environment has an effect on them as well. You see, the environment in which we set up is so important. So you and I get to do that. We get to set up an environment right here every Sunday so that every person that comes in here should experience the presence of God. That's exactly what Jesus would do. And that's what we get to do. It is the most important thing that any of us can do. Now, today what I want to talk to you about is an irresistible life. I want you to see that, first of all, Jesus' life was irresistible, was it not? You had to deal with Jesus. Now, a lot of people didn't receive him, but they didn't marginalize him. They couldn't push him over in the corner. They had to deal with him, right? And, and we, we, the church has to be dealt with. Jesus says this, and well, it says this of Jesus in John chapter 1 and verses 4 through 5. It says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Now, what I really want to see here is Jesus wasn't just life, but his life was a light. Notice how the Bible relates life with light, or it also relates life with darkness. Your life is light in that it shows people the way you you have light to walk through your life, or your life is darkness, it's evil, you, you don't do right to people, you're an evil type of a person, and you're stumbling through life. Life was the light of men, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness does not under, did, has not understood it. Uh, now we understand, don't we, that Jesus wasn't a, a literal light. He, he wasn't this, this light bulb walking around. You, you know what I mean, right? He wasn't a light bulb walking around, but his life lit. He would walk into a room and a spiritual light would come on. And this is what he wants us to understand. He wasn't a literal light. And when he's talking to us about being a light, he's not wanting us to walk around with a light bulb stuck on our head, but he wants us to be lights to the world. I know that the light of Jesus was a light, but what I really want to talk to you about today and, 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 and us understand is, is that I want you to know that your life is a light. I want to talk to you about your life. I want to talk to you about every life that's in the kingdom of God. You see, the Bible tells us that we are the body of Christ, does it not? We are His hands and His arms, right? We're His feet. We're His, we're his heart. We're His mouth. And what Jesus does today in the earth, it's done through us. I want to say something, and I want you to hear me correctly. The reason that the kingdom of God for 2,000 years has been filling the earth, and it's right now in an unprecedented stage of, of expansion, is because of Jesus, but more because of people that are lights. What's happening right now in the earth is because people are allowing their light to shine. And the church is simply irresistible. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, Jesus tells us that we are lights. Here's what it says. You are a light of the world. Uh, you will be a light of the world. What does it say? You are the light. There is no other light. Not talking here about him, it's talking about you. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot, say cannot, cannot be it. In other words, if you do church right, you can't hide it. You do life right, you can't hide it. Now let me, let me work here just a second. The word that he uses here for light in the Greek is the Greek word phos, P-H-O-S, and it means luminous. And the word world there is cosmos, and what that word means is it's the society, it's the arrangement of things, it's, it's the way society works, it's the environment. 
It's what we live in. And what he's saying here is that you are the luminous of your world. He compares church to a sun for this planet. He compares the kingdom of God and the church to the sun. That's what, as to what we are to the world, the sun is to the planet. Uh, for the planet to flourish, the sun has to shine. How many suns are there? When we say sun, we don't say a sun. It is the sun, right? S-U-N. There's only one. You are the light. You are the luminous for this society. There is no other one. For this society to flourish, it needs the church. It cannot do without it. For just as the planet needs the sun, society, the world, needs you. Now what God does and Jesus does is He strategically plants churches in areas to be luminous, to give light. God strategically put us here. you, you got to believe that. We're here for a purpose and it's to bring light to this region. That's what a church does. It brings light like a huge city. And if we do church right, you cannot miss it. You cannot hide it. Uh, do you have any idea how many people visit the city of New York a year? Visit. You don't, because it, it was phenomenal. I looked it up. In the year 2003, there was 37.8 million people visited New York City. Do you know how many people live there? 11 million. 11 million people live there. 37.8 million people from all over the world were drawn there. Why? Because you can't hide it. Years ago, Judy and I were going up, up to uh, Niagara Falls, and we went through New York. And, and we went through the toll bridge, or the toll gates, and we were on the interstate. And as we stopped at the toll gates, we looked over to our right, and there was New York Harbor. In the middle of New York Harbor is the Statue of Liberty. And then off to the left of that is New York <laughs> in Manhattan. And this was prior to September 11, 2001. And so at that time, the Twin Towers were still there. And folks, that was an awesome sight. It was so awesome, we pulled over on the interstate on the side and got out at night and looked at this. It was fabulous. We were taking pictures. And that city was saying to us, come in. Come in. Now, the, the story is kind of funny. We were so determined to get into that city, you have to go under the Hudson Bridge, or the Hudson Tunnel, to, to get to it. And so we went under it and went around and, and, and got into the city. And we, we come out of the, out, of the, out of the tunnel, and there's all these arrows going, so we just take one. And what happens is we just whirl around, and we go right back through the Hudson Tunnel. <laughs> and that's funny one time, but we did it three times. <laughs> we just <laughs> but we were so determined to get in there. And we did, and we got lost, and the rest of the story is not that good. But, but, the, 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 but the main thing is pulling over, I will never forget, the draw of looking at that city. And I believe the church should be that way, don't you? Do you know that most of the immigrants that came to America came through New York? Jesus said what? I will draw all men. See, most of your ancestors may have come through there. Many of your ancestors may have come through there. You see, that's what church should be. When people drive by or, 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 or come in, there should be this irresistible urge to come into it. And that's what Jesus wants the church to be. That's his strategy. You are the light. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. He says, I will draw all men to me. And if that is true, and it is, then why, and I'm a part of the FOSS, the light, then why am I not drawing more? If that is true, and it is, why is not LifeGate having a greater influence on our region? If that's true, and it is, why are you not doing more to draw people into the kingdom? You're inviting people, you tell me, right? Anybody invite people to church this week? Yeah, see, do, do they come? <laughs> why? Why is that? Now, in the next verses, Jesus kind of helps us, and he tells us something. If you've got your Bible, and I hope you do, look at Matthew 5, 5 15, and 16 with me. It'll be on the screens for us as well. It says there, neither do men light a candle. Now let me hold right there just a second. Jesus changes the light here. 
the light that he says, you are the light of the world, phos. If you'll drop down to that, to that next screen for me, please, and show that Greek word of that word. The, the word candle there is lupness. And what it means is a portable lamp. In other words, it's a lamp that would be used in a room or a house to bring light to a room or to a house. He says, you are, he's not in the foss now. It's not in the big sun, the great sun kind of thing where you're the light of the world. What he's saying now is this is your individual candle. This is your individual light. Go back to the verse for me, please. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. In other words, you don't light it and, and, and put it under a bushel. What you do is you, you light it and you put it on a candlestick. It giveth light unto all that are in the house. And then he says, let. Would you say let back to me? Let. This doesn't just happen. You have to let this happen. Your tendency is to put the bushel over it. But what he says, you've got to let it happen. It, 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 you let it happen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see something. You give them a light, they see something. You give them darkness, they see nothing. Let they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, let me, let me work here just a second, and I hope I don't turn this thing over. Everybody kind of wondering what this is? Never, have, never know, do you? You just never know around here what Delbert might do. Throw apples, shoot arrows, just never know. Okay, I have a bushel. Guess what's under my bushel? There you go. All right. All right. So what Jesus is saying is this. <laughs> Somebody asked me if I was going to have a fire extinguisher. What Jesus is saying is this, is you light your candle. Oh, boy. And you take it, and you're supposed to put it on a candlestick or up on a high so it'll bring light to the world, light to the room, and that everybody in the room that you're at will have light. But he says, but what we do is we put a bushel over it, right? Is that the image he's trying to give us? Or is this the image he's trying to give us? I'm a light, and I am lit by the Holy Spirit, right? Huh? And what I have done is this. <laughs> See, when I walk into a room, I'm supposed to bring light to that room, right? Right? See? But if I walk into a room like this, I'm not bringing a lot of light. Do you want to hang around with me if I'm like this? <laughs> See, it, uh, it reminded me of a story that I wanted to tell you. There, there was a lady in our church, and she's married, and, and her husband didn't come as much as she did. And... Uh, <laughs> And they were home in the bed one night, and, and, uh, and it was late at night, and he had to get out of bed. And so it was dark, and he didn't want to turn the light on to bother her. And so he stumbled over something that had been set in the floor that normally wasn't there, and he hurt his foot and his toe. And he hollered and said a few choice words, and then, and then uh, he finally said, Turn the light on so I can see. And she said, I am a light. And he said, Open your mouth then so I can see. Now, there's a truth there that I want to share with you. <laughs> there's a lot of truth in that. You see, when Jesus would go into a, a room, he would open his mouth and people would see. Uh, that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, the Bible tells us a story about Mary and Martha and Lazarus. That they were brother and sisters. And Jesus was at their house one time and, and people were sitting at the feet of Jesus and and in Matthew, uh, excuse me, in Luke chapter 10 and verse 39, it tells us about this. And it says, and, uh, and she, this is Martha, had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. You maybe remember the story. Martha became very upset with Mary because Mary wouldn't help her feed all these people and take care of all these people. And so Martha said something to Jesus and to Mary about it. And Jesus replied, I want to read it to you. And he says, Martha, Martha. The Lord answered, You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. See, Jesus says that you're a light, and that when you walk into a room, you illuminate it. You bring light to that room. Because see, when you go into places, wherever that you go, you're going to find people that are worried about many things. You're going to find people that are worried about their marriages, worried about their children, worried about their finances, worried about their health. They're going to be worried about their futures. 
And what we are to do is be a light and open our mouth and let our light shine so that people can see. This is the image that Jesus is... I think Jesus had a, a kind of a... I don't think he was really talking about that. I think, I think he was talking about this. I think he really had a, a sense of humor, don't you? <laughs> you're a light of the world, he says. And when you go into a room, you're supposed to bring light to it. People are worried. You have irresistible lives when we let our light shine. So I began to think about that. You see, I began to, to think, okay, if that's true, and the Holy Spirit has lit my life, then what about my life is irresistible? If, if I want to have an irresistible life like Jesus, then what about me is irresistible? And you know, I came up with something. And it's from that that this message is coming. I look back. What have I ever done where people wanted to be around me, and needed to be around me. What was it that I was about me that was irresistible? And I began to think, and I realized that the Holy Spirit had lit something in me years ago, and it's the message of the kingdom of God, the eternalness of that kingdom. And that whenever I get to share that with people, it so revolutionizes their life, they need to be around me to hear more about it. I'm irresistible when I do this. They could go just about anywhere and hear the cross and, and Jesus and being all that. But to come to hear about what, what God's lit me with, they need me. <laughs> and I started thinking about that. When I first came to the city, people would ask me over to their homes to, to feed me and take care of me. And, you know, and I would go. And for a long time in their homes, I would do, I would do this. You know, I would just sit around like this on the couch or at the table. I'd have my basket on <laughs> over my candle. But after I kind of got where I was comfortable with them and I felt like I could talk and better, I took it off and I would let my light shine. And I would share to them with them about the eternalness of the kingdom of God. I was thinking about our young people, Mary Grace and Bonnie and Lance and Bonnie and Jody and, and so many of them that have been in, 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 our, in our church for years. And, and every time they move away, every, every, every single one of them have had trouble finding a church where they could really lock in. And I was thinking, and, and it doesn't sound good, but here's what's happened, is they heard something from me about an eternal kingdom of God, and they refused just to sit under any old preaching. Right. Uh, Paul said, don't do that. Paul says, you be careful who you sit under. He says, he says if, if somebody try, tries to preach to you another gospel than what you've heard of me, let them be accursed, right? He says, be careful who you sit under. And they've had trouble finding it. I, I'm thinking about some of you that's been with me for 20 years. You know why? Is it because I am so good looking and so smart? Yeah. Partly, but, it, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the real reason is because you've heard an irresistible message about the kingdom of God. Yeah. I'm thinking about some of you that I've only known for a couple of years. And initially, when you meet me, I'm, I'm like this, right? And after I've got to know you a little while, and I can trust and know you're not going to run away, I'll take it off, and I'll share with you what I know. And it changes your life, and it's never failed. Uh, and, and how many of you know what I'm talking about? If, if, you bear, if you know what I'm talking about, I know some of you don't know what in the world I'm talking about, but if you know what I'm talking about, would you raise your hand just to verify what I'm saying? See? And, and that's why you need me. <laughs> See, uh, I was irresistible. Now, Others of you that don't know what I'm talking about, you're saying, well, if it's so cool, <laughs> then why don't you tell us? Delbert, you talk about the kingdom of God every week. No, not like this. Well, why don't you tell us if it's so great? Next week, I will. <laughs> Next week's lesson is titled The Irresistible Truth. And it's the message about the kingdom of God. And what we're going to have to do, I'm going to get you so stirred up and so goofed up that I'm going to have to have another service at 6 o'clock tomorrow, Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, so that you can come and ask questions. And I want to answer your questions, and I'll answer every one of them. But I promise you, it will revolutionize the way you see church and the kingdom of God. You'll see the eternalness of it. So anyway, that's not why I said all that. What I, I'm, my point in that is I have a light that is irresistible. My point is, what is your light? 
What do you do? What can you do? What do you do that draws people to you and makes you irresistible? Jesus says you have one, did he not? Did he say you are a light? You are the light of the world. You don't take the candle and light it and, and put a bushel over it. Show, take, be unbusheled, you know, unbushel yourself and show your light. So I want, I want you to think about that. That's what I'm really about today. What is your light? What do you do? I, heard, I read a story that I want to read to, or, or tell you about. Uh, it was about a man named Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball was just a normal person. He had a normal job, a normal family, and he went to a normal church. And, and he had a little Bible study that he would do in church. And one day, a, a man named Dwight came and visited him. Dwight. He came to visit him and to his Bible study. And he got, Edward, got, Edward Kimball got a, a burden on his heart to go and visit Dwight at his place of work where he was a shoe clerk. So he went to see him, and that day Dwight L. Moody became a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if you know who that is. Dwight Moody was this fantastic evangelist that, that ministered in England and Great Britain and the United States, and hundreds of hundred thousand people heard the message, and thousands and hundreds of thousands, well, well, tens of thousands came into the kingdom of God because of his ministry. And right today, Dwight L. Moody, our Moody, Moody Bible Institute, is still functioning right now in ministry. Well, in one of his meetings, in, in Moody's me meetings, uh, he ministered to a guy named Frederick B. Meyer, who ministered to another guy named Jill Wil Wilbur Chapman, who finally ministered to a man named Billy Sunday. Anybody ever heard of Billy Sunday? This very animated character, an evangelist. Um, history tells of him, what Billy would do is he would set up these irresistible environments, and people would come just to see what Billy was going to do, and then to get, get saved. So Billy, Billy Sunday was this, and, and so he would, he would do this. And history says of him that without the aid of microphones or televisions or TV, he preached the gospel to over 100 million people. Wow. Because of this Edward guy, you know? Well, well one day in, in, in Billy Sunday's uh, services, uh, he was in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, he got a, local, a group of local businessmen kind of stirred up, and they were going to have another uh, outreach for their, for their city, and he invited a, another evangelist named Mordecai Ham, another very animated character. But in one of Mordecai Ham's services, a guy came to it named Billy Graham. I don't need to tell you what Billy Graham did. Filling stadiums after stadium after stadium. Hundreds of thousands of people coming into the kingdom of God simply because one guy took his bushel off and went and lit, let his light so shine. You never know what will happen when you let your light shine. You have to let it shine. You have to work at it. You have to take it off. You have to strategically plan these things. And that's what I'm trying to get us to see. Strategically plan letting your light shine. Something about you is simply irresistible. It's your light. And when you let your light shine, people are going to come into the kingdom of God. Now, my wife is a very wise woman. And what I see, when I see her shine, she has this ability to talk to people on the telephone for hours. <laughs> now, now <laughs> I don't mean that. That's not a, a counseling. She can, I can't do that. <laughs> But she can sit there and, and talk to people for hours and counsel them, and I hear her open her mouth and let her light come out. I think she shines. I think she may have missed her calling. I think she should have been a psychiatrist or something. But you say, well, my point is, is that everybody has a light. And you got to let it shine. The Bible tells us so many people that did this. In the book of Acts, it tells us about a, a woman. Her name was Tabitha. And what Tabitha did is she liked to sow and she would use her light, her abilities to go and minister to people. Let me read it to you in Acts chapter 9 and verse 36. It says, In Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated is Dorcas, who was always doing what? Doing good and helping the poor. See, she would strategically do these things. She was a seamstress, and what she liked to do was make clothes, and then she would go and take her clothes to people and give them to them, but strategically she would tell them about Jesus and bring them into the kingdom of God. She used her light strategically. In Acts chapter uh, 4, we're told about somebody else. His name is Joseph. 
He was an encourager. He just, his light was to encourage people. He could go in and encourage anyone. He liked to be around people and he would encourage them and he was always bringing people into the kingdom of God. Let me read you about him. In fact, they started calling him the son of encouragement. Let me read it to you. In Acts chapter 4, verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was such an encourager, they changed his name to encourager. Do you know that it was Barnabas who brought Paul into the ministry? Saul, who was Paul the apostle, got so depressed and got so down that he went to Troas, his home city, and Barnabas went and got him and encouraged him to go into the ministry, brought him to Antioch, set him up in ministry because he was such an encourager. And look what Paul did because Barnabas let his light shine. Strategically, we do these things. Let me tell you about another one. A guy named Cornelius. This was a Roman soldier. The Bible says, though, of Cornelius that, that he had this gift. His light was giving alms or giving, helping poor and praying. Here's, here's what it says about Cornelius in Acts 10 too. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. That was his light. He would strategically do this. And let me show you one time what he did. He had a vision from God and, uh, and uh, an angel showed him some things, came to him, and it was about Peter. He said, go get Peter. So he went and got Peter, and he set up this strategic environment where he invited all of his relatives and friends, and the Holy Ghost fell, and all of them were saved and baptized. Let me read it to you. In Acts chapter 10 and uh, verse 24, the following day he, Peter, arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. You remember the story, don't you? Remember, he, he strategically set this up. It was an environment in which the Holy Spirit fell and all these people were saved and received Jesus Christ and were water baptized. So what I'm trying to say to you is if you will combine your light with strategy and strategically put these two together, there is an irresistible environment that you create. What is your gift? What do you do? What do you do for people that causes them to be drawn to you and attracted to you? That is your light. It might not be teaching a Sunday school class or preaching or, or, or doing those kinds of things, but maybe it's encouraging. Do it strategically. Maybe it's giving people money. Maybe you've got a little extra money that you give away. Well, well do it strategically and tell them about Jesus. Use the opportunity to let your light shine. Don't just walk around like this, right? Do it strategically and say, I'm going to let my light shine. I'll tell you a story. I was, uh, I was in the shower one day, and Terry and Angie had just begun coming to the church. They hadn't been there very long, maybe a couple of months or whatever. And I just felt impressed of God to go out with them that night and tell him about the kingdom of God, tell him what I knew. So we went out. We went down, to, I think, to Somerville and Nate. We were driving around, and I started talking to him. We came back into the house, and, and all of a sudden, wham, you know, it was like this, whoom, what <laughs> kind of thing. But what did it do to you, man? It changed your whole family, didn't it? I mean, I mean, I mean, right. I'm wanting to say to you, if you let your light shine, it has such an impact on lives that they never can get away from it. It's, it, it's always drawing them into the kingdom. If Jesus says, I'm going to draw them, then what he's meaning to is that you're going to draw them because you are being conformed to his image and we are his body. You are simply irresistible. God has given you an irresistible life. That's my title. Something about you is irresistible. What is it? I want you to think. I want you to figure it out. I want you to use it. I want you to use it as a strategy. We, together, corporately, set up irresistible environments. God wants you to be irresistible so that the kingdom of God will be simply irresistible. That's what it's about, folks. Nothing that we do is better or more important than this. Amen? You agree with that? How many of you are going to figure out your light and take your bushel off and let your light shine strategically? Would you, would you raise your hand if, if you really want to do this? I'm telling you, that's the thing that God wants us to do. He wants us to minister to people by letting the light that He's lit in each of us shine. Would you give the Lord a shout and a hand clap? Amen. Amen. Lord, we love you. We love you. And we thank you. Need your heads bowed, please, and your eyes closed. I don't know where some of you are with the kingdom of God or your relationship with the Lord. I know what the Lord wants to do is draw you in. And right now, you're 
You're here because he's drawn you here. Right now you're here because he's tugged you and pulling you into the kingdom of God. And so what I want to do is just give you an opportunity to allow him to bring you on in and change your life. He wants to. That's his desire. That's his plan. And to light a light in you where you can change your world, where you can light your home and your room in which you are. So if that's you and you're feeling God draw you today deeper into the kingdom of God, we want to use you and light you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, would you be praying for me, preacher? Would you just be praying for me? I see your hand. I see you. Any others? I see it. 